Hi, I'm uh, usually not used to being in a room uh, full of women. Uh, in, in my career as it stands today, you know, I coach in a men's professional league. I work for a man uh, by the name of Ice Cube, who's my boss. <laughs> it's pretty nice to see that on your phone when you wake up in the morning and it says, NL, how are you doing? Cube, right? <laughs> all right. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm here. First of all, I feel very blessed to have the life that I've, I've had. I was born in New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn, moved to Queens. I'm a young lady who was from a single family, no father, no food, no heat, no electricity, and we were one grandparent away from food stamps. So I am not a victim. I am a victor, okay? Some people look at their circumstance and they feel hopeless and helpless. I did at a certain point of my life. But sports and basketball changed my life for me, and I'm forever grateful. Whether it was sitting in front of PS 104 in Far Rockaway in Bayswater or being one of the few women to ever play in Rucker Park and that flowing red hair, it was really kind of cool because when I was on that 84 by 50 court up at Rucker in Harlem, I was never judged. I got tired of people telling me that I was stupid and dumb and I'd never make anything of myself. Nancy, why are you in the schoolyard with black kids? You want to know why I was in the schoolyard with black kids? Because they actually gave a damn about me. They didn't judge me. They embraced me. They championed me. When people that should have been empowering me, I hate to say it, my white community was telling me what I can't be. But I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about, maybe I'll quote Eminem, right? You guys know who Eminem is? I am who I say I am. You don't get to tell me who I am. I, I just rapped, by the way. <laughs> so that's my career playing in Rutger. Then I was told, you know what, Nancy? You're not going to be able to make this. You're not going to be able to do things. So I tried out for this US team in 1974. I make, it was almost like America's Got Talent. Uh, I make the US team, 10 of us from my area in New York. We get sent to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I come running home to my mother and I go, Ma, 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 you're not going to believe this. You know, I'm, I'm 14 years old when this happens. I said, Ma, I'm sorry, let me go back to how I really was. Yo, Ma, like, you know, I just made, I just made this team and they're going to fly me. To, I'm going to Albuquerque, New Mexico and, and we need money. And she goes, Nancy, I can't even put food on the table for us, honey. How can I send you to Albuquerque, New Mexico? So my high school principal, she took a can of corn, cleaned it out, put a little wrapper, and said, we're endeavoring to raise $300 to send Nancy to the Olympic tryouts. That can changed my life. It changed my life. It went door to door in Far Rockaway. We had enough money to send me and my coach, Larry Morse, to Albuquerque. Then the next year, I made the Olympic team. And you know, excuse me, the Pan American team. We won the, the gold medal in Mexico City. If I had listened to the woman that was coaching, Alberta Cox, didn't go here to the School of Cox, but Alberta Cox, if I had listened to this woman, I would never be in front of you today. We're sitting in the car as I'm going home, and she looks at me, and she says, now, honey, now you, you work hard on your game because we're going to need you in 1980. I said, like, coach, I'm not, like, real smart or nothing because I'm from New York but I know 76 comes before 80. <laughs> and, and you better get used to me because I'm going to be on that 76 Olympic team whether you like me or not. So there was no clinical reason uh, for how I acted. There was no Phil or Oprah at the time <laughs> to kind of work through my issues. But how dare Alberta Cox tell me what I can't be? We should be telling people what you can be. We should be empowering each other. So that's me. Uh, obviously, you've seen a few different hairstyles at this <laughs> age, but I have, the, I have the bling, okay? That's, at that time, that was really important uh, to me. So then, as a woman in a man's world, and that's what today is, you know, we women can no longer point fingers at men and say, he held me back. He's not giving me a job. He, that's a bunch of, that's not, that's not right. Okay. 
Men have empowered me in everything that I've ever done in my career, whether it was Bill Wall making the 76 Olympic team. I was 17 years old. I'm still the youngest Olympic basketball player ever, male or female. I was a senior in high school. Whether it was you know, coming here and playing for the Dallas Diamonds in 1980, I was the first pick in uh, the first Women's Professional League draft. I came from New York. Whether it was playing for Pat Riley, the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, and playing that summer of 1980, and that's coach behind, you know, the Hall of Fame coach. He's an amazing man. He gave me an opportunity to play. Obviously, I did not look like the other players that he had on the Lakers that summer. Four days into uh, playing for him, I was his starting point guard. We have to remember, just because I didn't look like the player he expected didn't mean that, that he couldn't be open-minded to the possibilities. And that is something that he has talked about throughout his career and he uses in his speeches, which he gets $100,000 and I get nothing out of that. <laughs> So I go through my collegiate career. I get a scholarship at Old Dominion. Of course, uh, let me tell you, my life has been riddled with Nancy Camp moments. Nancy can't do this. Nancy can't do that. Nancy can't make the Olympic team. Nancy, you're not going to go to college. We don't have the money to go to college. So you get a scholarship. Then you pick Old Dominion University. And they say, you can't win a championship. And they were absolutely right. I was really sad because we only won two consecutive national championships. <laughs> But, you know, Oprah has her vision board, and I have my, you have to see it, say it, be it. Write that down. You have to see it, see yourself being successful. You've got to say it, and then you can be it. And for me, it reinforces three ways how you build your confidence and your self-esteem and your decision-making. And, again, you don't get to tell me who I am. I get to change the narrative of what I'm going to be in my life. So then I play in all these women's leagues, and I coach in the WNBA, and then I'm really fortunate because Donnie Nelson, the president of the Dallas Mavericks, he has a team, the Texas Legends, in the NBA. Now it's the G League back then in 2010. It was the, the D League. Donnie didn't go in with a toe. He went in with two feet. They hired me as the first female to coach a men's professional league. Changed my life. See, I'm a lifer in this game. I just got dressed up nice for you today. <laughs> I am very uncomfortable in these heels. <laughs> and if I could have had my ankles taped, I would have, OK? <laughs> Transparency. We then go on to make the playoffs with the Texas Legends. See, everybody gives Coach Popovich, everybody gives, you know, Sacramento when they hired me as the second woman to coach in the NBA, even my friend Ice Cube. But it was Donnie Nelson and, and Evan Wiley who changed the course of opportunity for women in sports. So then uh, uh, Becky Hammond gets hired to be the first woman as an assistant coach in the NBA. Then I get hired in, in 2015 by the Sacramento Kings. Ladies, I don't want to sit here and give you, you know, my whole bio, but you can do anything you want to do. But you have to believe it. Know the power you don't know you have. You, ha you have the power to make change. You have the power to be successful. But it's how you walk. It's how you talk. And, and, and you got to stop the, uh, the drama. you got to stop the emotional stuff. Like, either I can coach or I can't coach. I'm a minimalist. Okay, I have to master the things that take no talent. It doesn't take talent to show up. It doesn't take talent to have confidence. It doesn't take talent to be a good person. That's what we, as women, have to do not only in our world, but in a man's world. They don't have to change for me. I walk through the locker room. Those guys are naked. That's a hard job, and I do it to the best of my ability. <laughs> OK? And when I'm walking and making sure that I'm looking at them eye level, <laughs> wink, wink, <laughs> I want to be the best coach that I possibly can to them. 
And you know what? I want to know about their wife. I want to know about their children. I want to know about what's going on with their, their mom or their, their auntie or whomever because we're building relationships. That's what these pictures are about. And then I took a year off. My mother was sick, and I left the Sacramento Kings as I'm moving through life. And this is how God blesses me in, in my life and my career. I'm at home last year, and I'm kind of watching the NCAA men's tournament. And I have my dogs, my Uggs. I'm flipping channels. I'm watching straight out of Compton. Yeah, I get that. And I am watching the tournament, and my phone rings. And it comes up on my phone, and it's restricted. So I say, you know what? I'm not, you know how we go. I'm not answering that. And we're so, we have to. We can't help ourselves. So I hit it. I'm like, yo, who's this? And the guy goes, yo. And I go, yo. And he says, this is Ice Cube. And I'm like, how'd you get my number? He says, I'm Ice Cube. <laughs> I was like, uh, do I call you Mr. Ice? Do I call you Mr. Cube? What do I call you? And he was so amazing. He's such a cultural changer and an icon. And he sees a, a broader picture of life, of, of people working together. And he hires me again now to be the first female head coach in a men's professional league in the big three. And one of the things he said to me, he goes, can you win? And I said, sir, I, I don't think you hired me because I couldn't. You, you hired me for an express reason to be competitive. And the cool part is we won the championship uh, this year in front of 18,000 people at the Barclay Center in August. And um, those are my guys. And it was really a powerful moment. So I show you these, these pictures, but for me, more importantly, it's about relationships. It's about we have the power to change the future. Again, I can tell you about going to my friend's house when I was little and being so hungry that when her, uh, Stephanie's mom would feed us tuna fish sandwiches for lunch, I was like, yeah, Mrs. Conrad, how you doing? I'm good. No, uh -huh. I'm, I'm good. Okay, I'm good. Everything, yeah, school's good. No, I don't cheat. Uh-huh. I was so hungry, and I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to tell anybody how I felt. There were times that I thought that I was going to kill myself when I was 8, 9, 10 years old. And here I am standing in front of you, and I'm, I just turned 60. And this is your cue to say you don't look 60. <laughs> Heather, help me help them. <laughs> but I love kids, okay? Kids change my life. Kids keep you young. And you, you, you can do anything you want. It's our job. I'm, I'm generation now, and it's our job to change generation next. It's our job to empower the future. It's important to let these kids know where our society is trying to divide us from each other. I want him to love me. I know we look different. I know that every time I walk into an NBA locker room or I see LeBron or Steph Curry or KD or any of the guys in the big three, I know I look different, ladies and men. I know I saw you come in. Very, very smart of you, by the way, if you're single, okay? <laughs> Things, the numbers, the ratios are right. Okay? So one of the things that I have to think about every day is I don't want to wake up just to wake up. I, I open, as we call it in my house, I open my shades and I say, thank you, God. You know, thank you for another day. I want to be an influencer. And if you're an influencer, you have to have a reason for people to follow you, not just because you say so or you make more money or your, your, your name on the card has a better title. You have to be an influencer every single day. And when I was in despair and I didn't know what I was going to do as a kid, I fell in love with this man. I was walking in my kitchen one day and there was this man on the TV and I'm staring. He goes, I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. I beat George Foreman like I beat Joe Frazier, like I beat Sonny Liston back in 1964. I'm too pretty not to be the champion of the world. I am the greatest of all times. And I was 10, and I walked in the kitchen, and I looked at my mother, and I said, I'm going to be the greatest of all times. I'm going to knock you out. <laughs> she says, I am your mother. I said, I'm going to knock you out in two rounds. 
I don't know what I'm going to do to him. She goes, him is your brother. And I say, he's in trouble. But I felt like this, this man, the black heavyweight champion of the world and the white little Jewish redheaded poor kid, he hit my heart. I am so grateful for that moment. I fell in love with Muhammad Ali at 10. By the grace of God, I met him at 19. I was doing an appearance for the New York Stock Exchange. It was a fundraiser for the Olympic Committee. And I'm going up the escalator with my mom and my best friend, and I asked the guy, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself, player of the year in college basketball, national champion. I said, who's the other athlete? And he goes, oh, we're going to the green room. It's Muhammad Ali. And I'm like, he's here? He, he's here? Muhammad Ali is here? I couldn't breathe. And I walk in the room, and it was like, ah, one of those moments. <laughs> Oprah does it better. And he, my man is like there. And I, 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 I walk away, and my mother goes up to him and goes, Mr. Muhammad, how are you? I'm Rini Rini Lieberman from Queens, from Far Rockaway. <laughs> my daughter is, is the greatest basketball player of all times. <laughs> and he goes, listen here, lady, there's only one greatest of all time, and it's me. <laughs> Mr. Muhammad, I know that you're good and everything, but my <laughs> daughter, <laughs> so he tells me to come over, and I'm just like, and I, I'm looking at him, and I'm like, Mr. Muhammad. And he goes, your mother says you're really good. I'm like, no, like, I'm not really good or nothing. I'm the greatest of all times. <laughs> and, and, and I hit people, too. He goes, you're not going to be able to hit people. I said, you do. He goes, I get paid. I was like, OK. But he was so amazing to me. And this is my man who he promised me that day in 1979 there would, be not, there would not be a day that he wasn't in my life. To the day we buried him in, in Louisville, I am so appreciative that this man loved me and the time he gave me throughout my life. He was my eyes. He was my passion. He showed me the way. He taught me about life competitiveness, you know, he used to say to me all the time, he goes, Nancy, the better you get, the more famous you get, the more successful you get, people are going to come at you. They're going to try to derail you. He goes, you have to respect everybody, but you have to fear nobody. I am fearless as a woman. I am not afraid to be a, a, a mom to TJ, who's six foot nine. Okay, I'm a little scared. <laughs> who's playing professional basketball uh, over in Europe. I am not afraid to work with Warren Buffett. I am not afraid to work for Ice Cube. I am not afraid to coach. I am not afraid to be successful. I am not afraid to be in the NBA. Are you? Do you wake up and have mind monsters? I can, I can't, this is why, my hair is not good. My, my. You gotta stop that, man. You're sabotaging yourself. You have to be confident, like Muhammad said, the greatest and shortest poem in history is me, we. If I'm a better me, we will be a better we. We can all do this. And then exponentially, we grow, we affect, we influence, and we get better together. My son TJ has made me a better person as a mom. There he is uh, in my first game coaching in the Big Three this year in Houston. I, I really think that every day you have to have intentional greatness, each and every one of us, because everything is possible. But Muhammad, the greatest love of all, I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe, no matter what they take from me. They can't take away my dignity because the greatest love of all is inside of me. I wish each and every one of you that you have the greatest love of all inside of you. I have been blessed in my life and in my career, and thank you, Heather, for having me. And my shot clock just went off. <laughs> God bless each and every one of you. Thank you.